Every time I sing that song, I think of two people. First of all, um, Frida Allen, his sister, who wrote many hymns, like Within the Veil, and many precious hymns. This was a poem she wrote, uh, actually during, at uh, Jesse Penn Lewis's birthday. She was, Jesse Penn Lewis was a little sister from England, under five feet tall, who did spiritual ballads and was involved in bringing revival to many people uh, there in England and everything. And uh, our dear sister Frieda wrote this poem, which was never made a song until our dear brother Christian Chen brought it to us when we were putting together that hymn book at Westminster. And uh, Christian said, you know, this is a poem. It needs to be a song. So anyway, I, I ended up putting the music to it, but it's the, uh, just the, the words. Chosen vessel, empty, weak and small, bearing heaven's precious treasure. And there's that little Jesse Penn Lewis, about this tall, so full of the power of the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful testimony to how the Lord doesn't need something big, something ferocious, something loud, something like me. He can do his work with any vessel that'll come to him. I'd like for us to uh, read that wonderful portion in the First Chronicles, chapter 29, David's last consecration. At the very end of his life, he uh, just brings everything before the Lord, and it's so wonderful. I just, somehow I feel like it's apropos for us to look at this, these verses. Then King David said to the entire assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is still young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now with all my ability I have provided for the house of my God, gold for gold, silver for silver, bronze for bronze, iron for iron, wood for wood, onyx stones and inlaid stones, stones of antimony and stones of various colors, and all kinds of precious stones and alabaster in abundance. Moreover, in my delight in the house of my God, the treasure I have, gold and silver, I give to the house of my God over and above all that I have already provided for the holy temple, namely 3,000 talents of gold, the gold of Ophir, 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the buildings, of gold for gold, of silver for silver, and all for all the work that is done by the craftsmen. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? Then the rulers and the fathers' households and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of the thousands and of hundreds with the overseers over the king's work offered willingly. And for the service, for the house of God, they gave 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold and 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of brass, 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever possessed precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly for they had made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart, and King David also rejoiced greatly. So David blessed the Lord in the sight of the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. And in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, O God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I? who are my people, that we should be able to offer 
so generously as this. For all the things come from you, and from your hand we have given you. We are sojourners before you and tenants as are all our fathers were. The days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided to build you a house for your holy name, it is from your hand, all is yours. Since I know, oh my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness, I in the integrity of my heart here willingly offered all these things. So now with joy I have seen your people who are present here to make their offering willingly to you. Our Father, we thank you that we can come to a God so magnanimous, so great and glorious, so full of riches and treasures, and the fact that you would even allow us to steward these treasures of Christ. What an amazing unworthy thing. But so you have done, and so we gather for these days. O oh Lord, may it be that all of us might in a most wonderful way so willingly give ourselves to thee that you would be satisfied with this offering of the heart. So we come to you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for a gathering of such a precious brothers, and we pray that you'll continue to speak to us as we go through these days. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Of course, I think we realize, but perhaps when these things happen, we're not so aware of what a unique opportunity this is to be together. Some of you I've known for more than 40 years. Some of you I've known when you were a child. And we are together here with brothers who have sacrificed for the sake of the Lord. We have workers here who have fought hard, served hard, preached the gospel, moved from place to place. We have brothers here who have been responsible at the cost of promotion on their jobs and spending time away from family. You know, the Lord loves every sacrifice given from a full heart. And I hope that your service is out of devotion and love for the Lord. Uh, I, I'm an outsider in a certain way, just because I, I was trained up well, I was saved in a Baptist church, and that's a good start, because I was truly saved. And they sent me off to seminary, and next thing I know, I was a Baptist pastor. And I learned all the ways of being a Baptist shepherd. There's some good and some bad there. But I was an outsider. You know, during that whole time, the 10 years that I was in that kind of realm, I was a pastor and serving and preaching the gospel, and I was so alone. Because as I served, I felt so uncomfortable in the places and the positions and the things I had to do. I was called on as pastor, not just to be a pastor, but an apostle, an evangelist, a prophet, a teacher, uh, you know, everything. And I'm not everything. So I was straining all alone. I wish I'd had fellowship like this. The wisdom that we heard even this afternoon, I, I'd never heard in four years of seminary because these are things learned by the Lord Jesus and by bearing the cross. A wisdom that is gained through mistakes and experiences, but these are the precious things. These are the things I wish my professors had told me, but no, I had to go my own way. And during those 10 years, I only had two friends who really helped me. One was my old brother, Ernie Heil. And he and I would get together a lot and pray, and say, you know, this thing stinks. There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. And that's why we started reading my second friend. I had a second friend, his name was Watchman D. I read every book that came out. It was beautiful. Every time I touched things, it, uh, you know, a guy, I, I was only really only three years old as a Christian, just about to head off to seminary. And this guy comes up to me with a trench coat on. He was, he was, a, he was a, a smuggler, a Baptist smuggler. <laughs> and he came up to me, and I was in this Baptist church, and he pulled this book out of his jacket. He said, here, here, hide it. Well, it was normal Christian church life. My heart literally flew when I read such clear uh, exposition of the scripture. But between my brother Watchman Nee and my brother Ernie Hiles, that's all I had. Until I ended up in Raleigh, North Carolina, some 40, more than 40 years ago. And there I met my dear brother, Stephen. 
And uh, there I heard him speak. And it wasn't the word of God I heard, I heard the Lord speak. And then I got in, because, because his pal was Lance Lambert, I got in with him as well. And it was my undoing. It was the beginning of the end. I left the pastorate. I tore up my ordination. I stopped preaching for a while. I, I, there, there's just so much that was wrong with my ambitions and things. But I saw something so beautiful in the church. And when I have a chance to get together with brothers like you, I touch something that's so precious. You know, I, I guess we all know the song and say it so much, but how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's such a precious thing. I, <clears throat> you know, during my uh, era as a professional pastor and everything, we, we had a lot of pastors' meetings where you got together with other pastors, but it was always a who could out top who, you know? <laughs> who had more people coming, who, how, who had more buses bringing in the Sunday school. It was always that kind of thing. It was always ambition. So, so wonderful to hear brothers who say, you know what? You see, here I was a pastor. I didn't have my target right. It wasn't Christ-centered. It was something, something else centered. The Bible-centered, all kinds of things. But Christ-centered. What a novel thought. Shouldn't that be the thinking of everyone in the church? Well, so it's why it's so precious for us to get together like this and uh, spend some time together. So... Uh, um, Come to you tonight, and uh, I use this passage of David's consecration because to me it represents very simply a, a picture of our present situation. It's something that uh, bears a, a time stamp. And I think that everything that we have to do from here on out has to bear a time stamp. That is to say, what time is it? In all of our doings, in all of our praying, the first matter is time. You know, David, part of the way, reason that his kingdom came together is that the sons of Issachar understood the times. And practically speaking, what that meant was the sons of Issachar took the ten tribes in the north and said, listen, it's time for us to join with David and Judah at Hebron and make David king over the whole kingdom. They sensed that was the timing. And in all of our ministry, there should be an overarching sense of knowing what time it is. What time it is, is it in the kingdom? Are we in the kingdom time zone in all the things we do? Of course, our, our brother gave his main burden, which we say, yeah, we've heard that before. And that is the Lord is coming at any moment. But you know, his watch is set that way. And that's very much in the forefront of his thinking. Is our watch set that way? What time is it? Uh, if we're going to give oversight and ministry in the church, what are we going to be able to do that brings in the king? <laughs> and of course, the story, to me, the story of David here in this um, uh, First Chronicles 29 is a picture of David standing at a paradoxical time. He was at the end and he was at the beginning. And I like that because that's exactly where we are. We're at the uh, end because it was, this was the last day recorded in his life. And he went home to be with the Lord. This was his last offering. And yet it was a beginning because he prepared the way for Solomon to build the house of God. So uh, we, uh, are here and uh, we're living in the same kind of paradox, if you want to say, because in all that we do, we must be watchful in prayer. We must be stewards who believe the master is coming back at any moment. And yet at the same time, till the Lord comes, we need to be about his business in the beginning of new things. At that moment the Lord comes in our, some of our assemblies, a child will just have been born. And somebody will just have been saved. And so we find ourselves in this kingdom where we're at the end, the very end, and we're at the beginning, both at the same time. And so we need to <laughs> uh, live wisely 
in these days that we live. One time somebody uh, talked to Martin Luther and asked him about the Lord's coming. And this is what the Martin Luther said. If I knew the world was to end tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree today. If I knew the Lord was coming back tomorrow, I would still plant an apple tree today. Now there's a man who lived in both zones. He could get on his knees and he'd say, Maranatha, even so come Lord Jesus. And then get up off his knees and deal with the uh, church, the, Re the Reformation church that was just forming and all those, even the political things that had to do with the formation of the church and all. So he could work at the end of time and still know he was just starting a reform of the church by the power of the gospel. He lived in those two kingdoms and I, uh, we brothers need to live in both those kingdoms. And the problem with both kingdoms is that is living in this lifetime and living with kingdom come very much on our mind is the things of this world tend to press us out of the kingdom time zone. We become too concerned with things uh, that weigh upon us and our souls. Our vision tends to narrow even as we serve the kingdom until our responsibility, our precious chosen uh, a vessel that were to be, instead of it being a vocation before the Lord, it, be, it becomes, responsibility becomes a duty. A list of things to be checked off. How many of you have been in a brother's meeting where we had a list? And there's usually one bean counter who's got the list. Okay, next. Now we got this problem. Check. All right, what's next? Next Sunday, who's going to speak? Check. And instead of us bringing things even before the Lord, we're checking them off and trying to get out of there as soon as possible because the ball game's on TV at home. <laughs> we get into this time where we're living in this world and it, we're tempted to even stop bearing the cross. Or perhaps like Haggai, everybody's building their own houses and the house of God is in ruin. Standing in this place, as David did, he shares his last <coughs> spiritual day with us, yet this very new beginning. And uh, it comes to me in this, in this way, that we are, must serve in the last hour, but we must make preparations for the ongoing of the house of God. Now in the story, of course you saw that David took his riches that he gained through victories and warfare, and then added his own personal wealth piled it all in, showing that his heart was absolutely set for one thing, the house of God. I know that you have busy jobs, family responsibilities, and many things. But if we come to consecrate our lives tonight, do we, in our heart, can we say, Lord, it's all for your house. This was the position that David, David was clearly in. His testimony of his heart was purely devoted to the Lord. And yet at the same time, he could say one more thing just before he passed away, and it was, I have prepared my son Solomon to complete the building. And I have provided all of these things so that he can build. So there was a future sense of preparation of preparing Solomon for this whole thing. So I simply want to very uh, simply apply this picture to us as servants of leaders in God's house as we find the standard to set in our consecration. It's interesting when you look out over the group here, we got some pretty young people here and we got some pretty old people here. As old people have been faithful for a long time serving God through a lot of difficult situations. And you know, it's tempted, it's tempted to be offended when you're serving the Lord or to stop seeking the best and the highest and the Lord's glory because we sometimes get treated pretty rough. Now some of these people have uh, uh, fought all their lives for the testimony of the Lord. They've moved here and there. And you know what the result of that is? 
uh, some have done that for a long time, they, they haven't gotten rich. But they bear the treasure, the riches of Christ within them. And this is what I think the Lord wants us to lay down as those who've been serving the Lord. We need to give our best. Building of the house of God needs to be with gold and silver and precious stones. We, we, we need that treasure of Christ that's born in that earthen vessel of ours. It needs to be broken yet one more time that the building of the house of God can be done. There are others here who are younger. Maybe they didn't go through that whole struggle uh, for years as a soldier, but they have had set before them the riches of Christ. Thank God for older brethren who sometimes have brought to us and presented to us the riches of Christ. Now, what are we going to do as we see the riches of Christ before us? Well, are we all in our consecration? As, as young as we may be, as inexperienced, are we willing to consecrate all that we have? It's amazing how much more treasure there was <laughs> among the princes and the youngest soldiers and things. You, you, you're surprised to see they just about doubled the amount. All the booty that David had. And suddenly, the princes turned out they had more than they thought they had. <laughs> but as David praised and worshipped God, he says, God, it was all yours. We had nothing. You gave us all. And now we give it all back to you because we have one heart for the house of God. And all the other brothers opened up their pockets and said, Amen. And I'm in on this too. And it says David was happy and the people were happy and the Lord was happy. Because this is really all he was wanting. So whatever our age is, whether we're young and old, great experience or whatever, maybe we can consecrate ourselves with this purpose in our heart, with whatever we have to build the house of God. Not only by the riches of Christ that we've come to know, that the Holy Spirit is guarding within each one of us, but also that we may consecrate ourselves as well the preparing Solomon's for the completing of the house of God. This is why I, I talk about this. This is why I see this picture before us. Now, so we want to build the house, the house of God with gold, silver, precious stones, till he comes. He may come tomorrow, but I hope I can lay out some gold tonight. And I hope the Lord finds us busy. Even after we pray, come Lord Jesus, I hope the Lord finds us busy when he comes back. That we're taking those things and preparing things for the house of God. Now, of course, I know that this bothers us because we're such poor and unprofitable servants. I, as we've heard testimony today, I think this is a fact. That the Lord doesn't choose the wise and the smartest and the most gifted to lead, many times they've got some other fire in their belly besides a fire for the Lord. And uh, some brothers who said, you know, we didn't let the brother loose because we realized the damage that could happen if the character isn't Christ-like. And how many times in the world there's such gifted preachers and teachers and everything, but their character is flawed and eventually the church gets offended. I remember one time Years ago, back in the early 70s, and I was out on Long Island, and there was a whole bunch of kids who were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, and the, some of the kids had gone off to, uh, well, they went off to a Christian college down in Louisiana, where Jimmy Swaggart had a university. And they were there at the time that our brother fell in sin. I don't know if you even know who that guy is. It was a long time ago. There was a television preacher who was, was unfaithful and exposed. But all I didn't know much about what went on down there in Louisiana. But I saw the kids who came home from that college. And some of them reported that some of the kids had, the, the very night they learned of the tragedy of what happened in, that, in their leader's life, had gone out in dissipation and rioting and drunkenness and sexual orgies because they were so offended. And they, they believed in this man and been so offended. So the Lord is looking for people with character. And so he doesn't, he can't always pick out the best. 
But can he pick out the faithful? This is what we want to be in these days. It isn't by might or by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. And in this picture, again, this picture is not that we are David laying down our treasure. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus laid the whole thing down for us. He's the one who spread those treasures before us. By his grace and by his power, and by his mercy, he's allowed us to do things that of our own natural ability we never could do. He's, he's built things and done things by the greatness of Jesus Christ. It, it, Jesus is the son of David who lays out all the treasure. And we're just those guys who are sitting there with our pockets full as well, with the riches that have come from knowing Christ. The riches of having rich fellowship, even like we've had to, today together in this time. But this whole purpose of ours, do we have a single purpose for building his house, preparing a bride, bringing in the kingdom? We've got nothing of ourselves, but we have treasure in earthen vessels. And the Lord wants us to make an offering. As we talk about doing things and being aware of timing, I just want to make a few comments because I believe, to me, it's always helpful to set our sense of timing in the book of Revelation, where we see things at the very end. These are the last days, and our lives and our ministry needs to be according to what the Lord is speaking to the churches in the last days. We need to be adjusted so that we can hear what the Spirit is speaking to the churches in these last days. And as you know, as the Lord went over his various churches, he gave commendations where commendation was uh, warranted. And he brought rebuke where repentance was necessary. I just want to tell you, now you know, I think you probably all know that historically, four of those seven churches are extant today. The church of Thyatira, which is basically uh, the Orthodox tradition and Catholicism. You can see uh, its workings there in Thyatira. And then Sardis, which we know historically was uh, parallel to the Reformation. And uh, then the Church of Philadelphia, as we know in, in such things as the Brethren Movement and the recovery that was found in the body of Christ in the 19th century. And then Laodicea. Now, I don't want to go anywhere near Thyatira as we just talk about things tonight and set our timing and our sense of what the Lord wants. Neither do I want to go to Laodicea, which to me is a church that's already totally lost its way. Because I believe that in some way we have characteristics of Sardis and some the characteristics of Philadelphia. If I know the fellowships and those that I've been among here, we, we fit into both of them, I believe, believe. And so I want to use those two churches just to speak for just a moment uh, and let the Lord speak to us regarding our place. Uh, let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. We'll just read a few verses there uh, from the church of Sardis, this Reformation church. But it's not that, it's us as well in principle. Sardis had a name and a reputation for right doctrine. But the church was actually falling into dead sleep. That's a problem today. Unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. 
But we'll just stop there for the moment because we hear our Lord's assessment of the church of Sardis. And we see that there is some small commendation there. This reputation that they developed was because they were faithful to proclaim the gospel and the doctrines. And uh, we know historically this was the time of the Reformation when uh, Luther and uh, John Calvin and others made clear these tremendous doctrines that are, were, were hidden in the Word of God. And they recovered these things and brought them into the light. There was a wonderful moment and a time in the history of the church when this Reformation all came along. But, well, and let me say this. One, I, I have not been to many assemblies that are here, but many I, I have been to. And I, I must say, for me, I'm very thankful that most of the assemblies that I have visited, their understanding of God's gospel and the doctrine of Christ is accurate and true. Praise God for that. Because once you get outside a pretty small circle of churches in this world, you find so much that is extraneous to the scriptures, unbiblical, heretical, and taking the saints in all kinds of directions, even as we heard our brother sharing this afternoon about the Toronto blessing and such things as that. But praise God, when I go into your midst, I, I don't feel uncomfortable at all doctrinally. <laughs> I, I feel really that we understand that Christ is the center of things. It's his precious blood and his redemption, his resurrection and his second coming. These things are all clear among us. As I have to say, I think it was clear among the Sardisians, those in, in Sardis. But they had need to repent because the church was losing its strength and spiritually about to die. The problem is this is a responsibility of God's servants. The saints are sheep. If they hear the master's voice, they respond with life. If they stop hearing the master's voice, they fall asleep. And so when there's a church that's full of doctrine, but about to die, then the leadership and responsibility must be doing something wrong. And we see it mentioned twice here in these few verses in Revelation chapter 3, that somebody is not watching. Notice in verse 2. Be watchful. And in verse 3, If therefore thou shalt not watch. Now the watchers are the overseers. That's our job, to be the eyes, to see what's going on, to be watchful. And this church is dying, and these men in responsibility, it must be the overseers. And here's Jesus who says, I am here with the seven spirits of God. I'm looking for watchers. I'm not seeing watchers. Watchers. The fact of the matter is, just like the Reformation, if you know uh, uh, the Lutheran history and things like that, in the Reformation and things, they, they taught doctrine. They emphasized preaching the gospel. They emphasized the word of God but it shows that these things alone does not keep us in life. If we preach and preach and preach and preach, but we're not watching and watching and watching and watching, the church can go into death. We can preach them to death. And really, uh, many churches in the larger denomination of things, the Sardesian churches are preaching the gospel and, it, and the churches are dead. Preaching does not keep the church alive. There must be something more. And so many here are in assemblies, as I am, where people, where a kid who's 12 years old could tell you what God's eternal purpose is. <laughs> That's strange, because I was a Baptist pastor, I couldn't tell you what it was. They, don't, they, they have vision, they see God's eternal purpose, they can talk these kinds of things, a body life, the second coming, uh, their minds are full, but sometimes their hearts are dead. Can we have Christians who just have minds full of doctrine, but hearts that are dead? Something is wrong there. And of course, why aren't the watchers watching? Well, there's a deeper reason. 
which we see here when it's mentioned. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. As I believe, at least how I want to apply this to us, I'm sorry, may, uh, your assembly may not be Sardesian at all. But oh, I pray when I visit, and even for ourselves there in New York, that there would be life. Life, as some brothers have testified today. Not just doctrine and words, but life. It seems so lacking. I've been in some assemblies where they take the Lord's table. It seems like a dead exercise. A few old sisters pray some prayers and they sing one hymn. And they kind of half-heartedly take the table. It should never be that way. It should be the most life time of our assembling together. But you know, any of these things, these doctrines, these practices can just die if there's one thing missing. And this is what I want to uh, speak about just for a moment. Where are the priests? There are some there whose garments have not been soiled, but most of the garments have been defiled by the wor world. I do believe, if I could say this, that men who are workers and men who are in responsibility, there's something more important than preaching the Word of God. And that is being a priest in the throne room of God. Now the church needs overseers. Overseers represent the head to the church. But if the head is not hearing from the head, then the church doesn't hear the Lord's voice and spiritual problems take place. Uh, and there as responsible brothers, we're to stand together corporately as priests and come out of the holiest place with an answer. Our dear brother Lex, I hope he expressed a testimony of what's real with you. I hope you're not satisfied till all the brothers see clearly the way forward. But the only way that happens is, is if, if brothers can get together before the Lord and find out what the Lord wants. Now, why am I saying all that? Brothers, I'm just going to be honest with you for a moment. Now, I, you can kill me afterwards. We received almost 100 questions when we asked for questions. Many of the questions show such poor spiritual quality among leadership. The questions are raised by people who aren't finding answers from the Lord himself. That is the only way we find the answers. We don't find the answers by asking Brother Stephen. We don't find the answers by finding spiritual wisdom or, or getting some book somewhere. But brothers, our spiritual condition was exposed in those questions. All of our spiritual condition. Sometimes, praise God, we uh, get into such a problem, uh, as Kenny shared today, that we're completely undone and we find ourselves like Moses on our face before the Lord. And the Lord speaks to us. But can I ask a question? Should overseers be those who just react after problems have already come upon us? Is it possible to walk in such a way that before the Lord we are spiritually anticipating even things that would come upon us? But this takes a life in the Holy of Holies, a life of spiritual exercise. Our brother Stephen, over the last five years, I think, especially out on the West Coast, shared a number of messages on spiritual exercise. I think probably in Richmond it was also, but <coughs> most other places haven't really heard, heard those messages. But our spirit is the highest part of our being. And our spiritual life is the most important part of our body life. But if there's no spirit, spirit life at the top, then it's soul life in the body. And soul life has a shelf life and eventually fades away. Now here, 
here's a, it's a very living problem because as we've heard today, the brothers in responsibility and leadership have disagreements with each other and sometimes strong disagreements with each other. Some are, are, are very strong about some doctrine and some are very strong about some experience and so on and so forth. And that's who we are. But the Lord wants brothers who actually go in together humbly before him saying, now, Lord, we're just at an impasse. Now, what do you want? that's how we all find the cross. We find out that our brother that we love and disagree vehemently with has got something there that's right and something that needs adjusting. And that we are right in a certain way, but need adjust. Now that adjustment is only found before the Lord. And here, should it be this way, or is it too much to ask? That five brothers should be able to go into the holy place and find the Lord's way. Or is it too much? And so they say, Let, let's make it just one brother who hears everything and tells us what to do. Moses, listen to God. We'll do whatever you say. Is that the Lord's design? No, he wants priests in the house of God. The saints need priests in the house of God. When the spiritual reality of Christ and his headship has been touched, the assembly comes alive. There's life there. And then the Word of God is fruitful. But without that Holy Spirit fullness in our assemblies, we're kidding ourselves if we think we can, uh, uh, if we think we can generate life by soulish, even mental, uh, intellectual discussions. Oh, I, I felt for the brother from Minnesota. Can you imagine having a fellowship that's basically made up of professors and doctors and, and PhDs and the, uh, scientists and... Oh, you know, smart people are tough. <laughs> they got such a soul life of intellectual independence that the Lord has to hit them with a two by four <laughs> before they'll uh, accept that there may be another way. And as, but as long as our fellowship is at that life of the soul. Now, all I'm trying to say is this, brothers, if anyone should be able to bring the saints up into the Holy of Holies, so they can learn spiritual exercise. Exercising our spirit before the Lord in communion, in listening, in waiting, in obeying. These things sound simple, but most of our Christian lives are lived at the level of our understanding, and we make decisions on the level of our understanding, and we don't go to the holy place, and eventually it shows. We just end up, we've made a whole lot of little compromises in the assembly, and we're dying. Please, brothers, I don't want you to hear that your assembly is dead. That everybody knows everything. God's eternal purpose, the second coming, and they're dead. May it be that the church has found the holiest place. And there's life. Even the simplest life. But life, this is what I believe the Lord's trying to say. He wants the people to hear the shepherd's voice. The Lord is speaking to that church of Sardis because... Because they're ready to die. And in these last days, churches are boarding up all over the place. But those, who, those brothers who will spend, go to the cross and, 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 and expend the cost of really hearing the Lord and coming out in agreement together, this is precious. And we've heard testimony of how the Lord brought the different ones into that kind of a place. So let's not pretend we're spiritual leaders. If we just come together once a month and tick off a bunch of questions with, you know, with the wise answers, uh, let's do that. Well, let's do this. And we haven't prayed. We haven't really thought about it. Many of those questions we're ticking off. Uh, there's, there's deeper things involved. And we should uh, just be before the Lord on these things. Be watchful. Be overseers. Be shepherds over the life of the sheep. Well... Now let's just do a little bit of Philadelphia. So let's uh, read here a few verses in Revelation chapter 3, beginning of verse 7, to the church of Philadelphia. Because I want to use it as an illustration of this matter of preparation for the next generation and a raising up of Solomon's to build the house. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, 
who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I've put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Now here is a, a church that obviously knows they have little strength. And there's not many wise, many noble, many rich. But they're holding on to the word of God and they don't deny his name. And the Lord in his mercy has opened up a door of opportunity. Now I, I want to say I don't know what the door of opportunity was for the church in Philadelphia. I don't know what that meant if there was an inroad of the gospel in among the Gentiles or in some particular specific thing. But I know that when that door was opened, the Philadelphians felt ill-equipped Ill to go through that door. And so the Lord was telling them, go through that door. Go through that door. Now, here's, what, here's how I want to apply it. Some of your children, I know, because you threw me in the lion's den with them, at WCCC, or even at the Richmond Conference for years, and I dealt with your children, and I just want to say, they're the most precious children I ever was part of. I, I done a lot of youth work in my younger days, but your children are precious. There's a door of opportunity there for them to build the house of God. But it burdens my heart when I see so many of them leave leave the assembly. It's because they're given opportunity. You know that happens, right? They know so much of the Lord, although they don't think so. They just think they're just normal until they go to some other situation and, and they just start saying a few things and, and people think that they're so valuable that they give them an open door. Like our brother who was put into a ministry, into varsity, saw them. They take our best kids. But they give them an open door of opportunity. And I want us to have an open door of opportunity in our midst, in our assemblies, even though we are doing a, a work that could be despised because it's so small. No, 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 no. So precious, this Island testimony, that they learned the hard way to embrace and love their children, and now there's something to be gained, and these graduate students are coming back. It's a wonderful testimony. But, but it's a, such a burden when I see kids that I saw growing up and get saved and everything, and now they're off somewhere. They're off somewhere. And one thing I know, they're busy probably as Christians. But I can't say in the sense we would say it, they're building the house of God. They're doing a lot of stuff. Oh, that they could build the house of God. Oh, that our young people, even, even that second generation, isn't it such a shame? It seems like the first generation comes into something and then the next generation goes bye-bye. These things shouldn't be. I believe if we know we have little strength, we hold on to the word of God, we don't deny his name, we must find a way of embracing our young people and discipling these young people. So, well, let me put it this way. I want to see them become men and women who are responsible, who serve God, who know what time it is, who love God's house. And even if they do leave and move to L.A. because of a job or something like that, may it be they leave with the burden for the house of God in their heart. And not just get into, you know, some other kind of idea of what the Christians emphasize today. Oh, for those young people who want to see the house of God built. And I think every, every fellowship here, even if you don't have so many young people right now, I believe there's a door of opportunity. If brothers will be faithful to give the riches of Christ, the riches of Christ, not, don't, don't just say to the teenagers, you know, wait till you grow up, then we'll fellowship together. It's now that they need to hear the truth of Christ and the riches of Christ and the vision of Christ and see what the house of God is all about and put their heart toward being the bride. They, they, they need to see it while they're young. If, if we just ignore them, they leave. And then we feel so badly and wish they hadn't gone. I think, uh, I think we need to find ways, perhaps practical ways, to prepare our sons 
to build the house of God. Some, some of us, I don't know if I include myself, but some of us are old soldiers. Like David, you did a lot of fighting, did a lot of gospel preaching, did a lot of this and that, moved to this country, started all over again, went through a lot, learned a lot, paid a lot, and you've seen the Lord. And it's a shame to me when your own children don't want to go that way. But you know what? David was a fighter. God said, I'm sorry, you can't be the builder. So David took his son, Solomon. And you know, the beginning of the book of Proverbs, where my son, my son, my son, that's not, that's not Solomon's words. Those are David's words that are ringing in Solomon's heart when he was a kid. All of that wisdom he gained because David invested his life in Solomon and prepared him to build the house of God. I think there's still a way to redeem this in our fellowships and our assemblies, but we need to be aware of those young people who show some promise, who have a heart, and to uh, help them to, dis to, to find out how to be faithful and to serve, and to serve out of character, and not just release them into a bunch of busyness, but develop that character of Christ. Help them understand the way of the cross, these things would produce, I believe, the house of God. Because for some of us, we're at the end. And at the same time, it's a very beginning. The house of God needs to be built. And are we preparing such a generation for such a thing? Well, <laughs> Jesus went about Galilee for two years and his disciples trailed along. But after two years, he stopped those disciples and sat down with them and talked to them for one whole year before he went to the cross because he wanted some men who could build the house of God. I've always appreciated our, our dear brother Stephen. And I hear stories from 50 years ago, how he was building some young people to serve the Lord in New York. Now, even now in Richmond, still building, seeing Solomon's raised up. Wouldn't it be precious if we had Solomon's with wisdom, character, who could build this house of God? and the Lord come back. You know, there's a verse, <laughs> you know how sometimes a little verse get, gets you and stays with you a long time. There's a verse in Acts chapter 20. It's just one of those verses, by the way, kind of thing. But to me, it really spoke to me about this matter of am I helping younger ones be raised up. In Acts 24, it just mentions Paul starting to head out from Ephesus, and it says, And Paul was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. Now there's a list of seven young men that Paul was training all the while he was working. And there were more, just not included in this list. So there was Paul for three years in Ephesus. And while he was there, he not only was preaching the gospel in the school of Tyrannus, and not only fellowshipping over at the Priscilla and Aquila's house, and not only you know, preaching the gospel and, and, and the, uh, uh, preaching the kingdom of God and all that personally, but he is also taking these young men, raising them up, training them, teaching them Christ, teaching them the cross, teaching them service, teaching them humility teaching them uh, what it means to live by grace, which is sufficient. And so after three years, he lives with these seven guys who became servants of God as they went from place to place, many of them back to their own hometowns. I wonder if the Lord tarries, if we'll have prepared seven Solomons in our church who can go on when we give away our riches. Hmm. I believe this is a blessed opportunity for us. I think we need to understand that we're in the book of Revelation. We're not reading it, we're in it. And these are the last days. And because it's the last days, our young and old have got to be trained in two unique ministries, if I could put it that way. Number one, how to become an overcomer. You notice in the book of Revelation, it doesn't say now uh, we, we need some more elders, we need some more deacons, we, we need some more apostles. It says, you know what we need in this last hour? Overcomers. 
We need brothers and sisters who have learned to be and been encouraged to be faithful, to bear the cross, to endure suffering, to hold on to the testimony of Jesus through difficult times. In these last days, this is the kind of quality of person the Lord wants raised up, the overcomer, those who are able, those who are willing to pay the price and stand for the Lord in these last days. And then, secondly, it's very interesting, the Lord has to have in His churches angels. Now, who are those angels? Well, again, it doesn't say it's a pastor or a teacher or an elder. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. But what they were is people who not only could hear what the Lord was saying, but convey the message to the church. There needs to be brothers and sisters who have such a heart that they know what the Lord is saying. Just like the angels who uh, communicated the messages of Jesus uh, to the assembly when they gathered together. We're at, the be we're, be we're at the end, we're at the beginning. And in light of that, I just want to share one more verse and to mention a few things. In Isaiah 66, verse 8, there's this wonderful prophecy right at the end of Isaiah. And it says, Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who's ever seen such things? Can a country be born in a day, or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. And I wonder how close we are to the Lord coming back for his church. I wonder how close, it, it sounds, in, he says, who's ever heard of such a thing? Can something like that happen in one day? And when we look around, we say, no, it can't. But you know what? If our hearts are set like David and those princes and say, Lord, accept the consecration as we give the riches of Christ to build the house of God, accept this, understand our hearts. That may be the last thing the Lord is looking for to come back how soon he can complete the job. It's, it's just incredible for us to believe. So, here's what I, uh, I'm done. I want, us to, I want to suggest we pray about a few things tonight before we go. I wonder if we couldn't place ourselves on the altar, not as elders or workers or servants, but as those who have been given by Christ gold, silver, and precious stones. And if we could uh, consecrate ourselves to building the house of God just with our best, with gold, silver, precious stone, not wood, hay, and stubble. But this involves a priesthood in the holy place. This involves overseers who are watching and careful, consecrating ourselves. I'd also like for us to pray for our wives, that they could, as we place them on the altar, that they could be understanding of us and our weaknesses, and continue to be help meets to us and help us minister. Third, I wonder if we couldn't pray for our children and our young people and those who are among us now, that's our opportunity, that we might be able to prepare Solomon to build the house of God out of those young people. And then finally, the, if we could pray one more thing regarding ourselves. It's a hard thing to do in a way, but as we come before the great shepherd of the flock, for us to lay down all pride of position or status among men and just be like David with a heart fully for the house of God, who's received much, who's given much, and whose heart is steadfast toward the Lord. And this day, the riches of the Lord has been placed at our feet. Does it inspire us to lay down the treasure that's in our earthen vessel to allow us to be broken, to give the best? I cannot help but believe if we gave of our best to our young people, Solomon's would not be raised up. If we can give them gold and silver and precious stone so they can see and handle and touch the Christ that we've come to know, surely some will develop that hunger to be overcomers and wise men who can finish the work that we've begun. This is our prayer as we come together. This is not only a time for us to learn lessons, it's also a time of consecration. May the Lord help us as we come before him 
and give our offerings tonight.